Good morning to everyone watching us live today on Zoom. We have almost 100 registered participants so far, and we are also live on Facebook, so we can expect even more watching us live today. Welcome to Supply Chain Outlook Live, where we will look ahead at the issues and developments that are set to shape the supply chain sector in 2022. I am Rose Tobeo, your host for this morning's session. This year is shaping up to be another exciting and challenging one for the Philippine supply chain. It's been almost two years since COVID-19 struck, and now, more than ever, it feels like we are heading towards a new phase. Vaccination numbers are improving. Um, consumer confidence is showing another uptick. Businesses have weathered the worst of the economic disruption and are ready to address new and ongoing demand. Still. We remain a bit uncertain. Are we ready if another wave of COVID-19 cases arrives? Would the progress we have painstakingly built come crushing down again? In the past couple of years, we at SEMAP have talked with stakeholders and partners about what they've done to emerge from the disruptions and even improve the way they, they uh, provide value to customers. It is clear to us that a critical component is encouraging and fostering innovation, being open to new ideas, investing in those that we believe will elevate the way we work, deliver, and serve. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, on the first half of this year's Supply Chain Outlook Live, we have invited speakers at the forefront of promoting innovation to share with us their insights on how we can begin or continue our journey towards promoting and fostering innovation. We will also hear from the president of SEMAP as we lay out our plans and initiatives for 2022. And finally, later this afternoon, we will hear from our dear friend Ronnie Balbiran of the Reed Foundation as he breaks down our economic prospects in 2022. But first, we begin this morning's session with our keynote address. Joining us this morning is Dr. Rafaelita Aldaba, Undersecretary of the Competitiveness and Innovation Group of the Department of Trade and Industry. In this role, USEC FITA plays a key role in the formation and implementation of the Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy, or the I3S, which aims to develop innovative and competitive industries, as well as grow linkages with global value chains. She also leads the DTI's efforts to build an inclusive innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem with stakeholders in the government, industry, and the academe. She also leads the agency's work in ensuring the competitiveness of businesses, particularly in supply chain and e-commerce. A researcher turned policymaker, Yusek Fita previously led research projects for organizations such as World Bank, Asian Development Bank, the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, and the United States Agency for International Development, or USA. And before joining the DTI, she was acting vice president of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, the government's primary social economic policy think tank. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yusek Rafaelita Aldaba. A round of applause, please. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rose. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, may I start already? Let's go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Yusek. Okay. Please start. Mr. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pierre Carlo Curay, SEMAP President. Mr. Dennis Lovido, um, SEMAP President-elect. Ms. Corazon Kurai, SEMAP Executive Director, SEMAP Previous Presidents and Directors, members of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. And of course, I can see the names of Dr. Henry Basilio, Dr. Paco Sandejas. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here at the annual Supply Chain Outlook Live. And thank you to the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines for inviting me to discuss the Industry 4.0 policies and programs of the Department of Trade and Industry, along with our new industrial policy, 
the Philippine Inclusive Innovative Industrialization or IQBS amid this post-pandemic recovery. DDI policies and programs on innovation and digital transformation involve embracing Industry 4.0 technologies and adapting them to local conditions through innovation. As I will later uh, show, our incentive system is also aligned with this goal of adopting new technologies emerging from Industry 4.0, and more importantly, the need for us to focus on human resource development, reskilling and upskilling our workforce for the jobs of the future. These technologies and uh, new skills and capabilities would be needed in our economic recovery, especially as we build resilience and prepare for the post-crisis future. Uh, next slide, please. Next, please. Okay. McKinsey suggests that uh, the world is currently seven or more years ahead of schedule when it comes to digitalization. And I would like to highlight some of the key learnings that we can draw from our recent experience. First, digital technologies and innovation have played a crucial role in ensuring quick responses to the crisis. Second, as the race for survival intensifies, more innovation would emerge and the less innovative firms would fall behind. And third, it's not only the innovative firms that survived, the more resilient firms thrived during the crisis. So now resilience to external shocks is seen as a competitive advantage. And as we enter the new normal, we would expect firms to tailor their production and supply systems to changing consumer behavior. And this would require agility in production and supply systems enabled by advanced technology and automated processes at the same time. So there's really a need to adopt new ways of working to increase resilience. And all this need shared responsibility and collaboration between industry, academe, and the government. So we need a whole of society approach. Next, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit slow, but uh, okay. Based on a technology utilization uh, survey that we conducted, on the overall, the bulk of our companies have low technology utilization, meaning these companies are still using purely manual operations or spreadsheet management system or a standalone database management system with legacy applications. For instance, 44% have no maintenance system, 53% control and track manufacturing activities manually, through a paper-based system. For 44% of the companies, raw materials are pulled into the shop floor via an unstructured request system. 46% have no established cybersecurity procedures and 58% have no manufacturing equipment connected to the network. And as expected, micro and small enterprises have the lowest technology utilization scores. Next, please. Next slide, okay. Across the different manufacturing sectors, the highest utilization score is in, non, is in um, other non-metallic products, which include cement, paper, computer, electronic, and optical products, motor vehicles, and pharmaceutical products. Meanwhile, the lowest technology utilization is in textile, leather, beverages, garments, repair and installation of machinery and equipment, and food products. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, so we view these new technologies as drivers to achieve an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable industrial development. Through the use of artificial intelligence or AI, for example, 
we can create new products and services leading to jobs and income opportunities as well as to the creation of new activities. By adopting smart manufacturing, we can improve productivity. At the same time, new technologies can reduce our material and energy use. Next, please. Okay, so uh, as you can see on the slide, our industrial strategy is given by I cubed S or Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy. I cubed S aims to grow globally competitive and innovative industries. And innovation is at the front and center of our new industrial policy. The strategy has six major pillars, embracing Industry 4.0, along with developing innovative startups and micro, small, and medium enterprises, integrating our production system, especially deepening our global value chain participation, bridging the gaps in our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, very important, upskilling and reskilling our workforce, and creating an enabling business environment. So what we want to happen is really for us to be able to create a more dynamic industry ecosystem. Next, please. So using new technologies like voice recognition, AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, 5G connectivity, and industrial internet of things, we can create new products or solutions, especially in the following areas, smart buildings and smart home technology, including smart manufacturing and precision agriculture, digital health, e-gaming, smart assistance, vehicle technology, resilient technology, along with audio, video, and education technology. Next, please. DTI initiatives are geared towards helping our companies shift to industry transformation. We have been carrying out an awareness building program through Industry 4.0 workshops. We also plan to build Industry 4.0 pilot factory and SME Academy to provide Industry 4.0 trainings to our micro, small, and medium enterprises. At the same time, we also encourage companies to embark on their own industrial transformation first by going through the city assessment or the smart industry readiness index this is the gold standard in industry 4.0 assessment we are partnering with the world economic forum with asian development bank along with tech companies like siemens in assessing the technology readiness of companies using siri now, the CREATE or the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act um, provides support measures for innovative projects that companies could access as they implement their industrial transformation plans. I have more about this later. Next, please. DTI is also working with TESDA, CHED, and DepEd, as well as with industry and the academe including tech voc institutions in formulating our skills development framework to prepare our workforce for the jobs of the future and ensure that the skills demanded by companies would be uh, sufficiently provided. We have actually prioritized 10 industries. You can see them on the slide. And uh, first to finish is actually the skills development framework for supply chain and logistics. And I congratulate, I, congr I would like to congratulate you on that. Next, please. And our most recent initiative is the Artificial Intelligence Roadmap, which focuses on uplifting the lives of our people, industries, and the economy to accelerate innovation and MSME digitalization. One of the major recommendations of the roadmap is the building of a center for AI research. The AI Center is going to be a public-private partnership and would serve as hub for data scientists and researchers to perform collaborative AI R&D, provide consultancy services, create AI tech products, conduct data literacy programs, and attract 
leading global firms to set up their R&D activities in the country. Our areas of focus include uh, precision farming to improve the productivity of the agricultural sector and increase the incomes of farmers, along with smart manufacturing, healthcare services, AI-powered business process outsourcing, smart cities, and resilient technology. Next, please. We believe that, uh, okay, so before I move on to that, uh, let me discuss uh, the CREATE a little bit. As you know, this is going to, this um, new uh, legislation is going to reduce our corporate income tax from 30% to 25 and 20 percent depending on the size of your enterprise and it is also going to offer a menu of incentives consisting of income tax holiday from four to seven years a five percent special corporate um, income tax or seit and this is based on your gross income earned and um and then there's also another um incentive the enhanced uh, deductions along with the usual duty exemption on importation of capital equipment, raw materials, and VAT exemption on the importation and VAT zero rating on local purchases, although some of this would uh, only be available to exporters. Next, please. And uh, this uh, would give you uh, a picture of uh, the various uh, incentives and uh, uh, this would depend on uh, the tier uh, wherein your activity would fall along with the geographic location of your enterprise or your activity. And uh, let me say that the farther away you are from NCR, the higher the incentives. And um, export uh, activities would relatively have higher period of availment of the incentives as well. And uh, you can see on the slide that uh, um, for export market activities, they could get incentives from 14 up to 17 years, depending on the tier and the location, of course. And for domestic market activities, they could enjoy from nine years up to 12 years. And again, depending on the tier, as well as on uh, the geographic location of the activity. And the tier would imply that the more high tech the activity is, the higher the incentives that you would be able to enjoy. Next, please. And here uh, get, provides us a brief description of the various tiers. It, like what I've said, uh, the more high tech, the higher the incentives. So under tier one, this would uh, uh, comprise of activities with high potential for job creation, as well as uh, support to uh, sectors that would be critical to in industrial development. And that would include logistics, of course. Tier three would be uh, for those uh, activities, producing supplies, parts, components, and um, intermediate services that are currently not being uh, produced yet locally. And tier three would be for activities such as R&D, uh, higher productivity, breakthroughs in science and health, along with uh, account, also characterized by high paying jobs. Uh, commercialization of R&D investments would also fall under uh, tier three, along with uh, really the highly technical manufacturing activities. Okay, next please. Uh, these are just some examples of uh, which activities would fall under the different tiers. So under tier one, we have agriculture and food processing, and this would also include um, um, aquaculture and mariculture, along with uh, design-focused uh, uh, activities such as furniture, games, toys, and jewelry, along with uh, garments and textiles. Uh, health and medical products, along with energy efficiency and environment uh, friendly activities would also be falling under tier one. For tier two, this would be uh, activities or projects falling under iron and steel, fabricated metal products, basic chemicals, tool and dye, and so on. And for tier three, we have uh, identified under this list, uh, the production of 3D printers, for instance, drones, robots, cobots, electric vehicles, uh, plug-in hybrid uh, EVs, 
uh, autonomous vehicles, smart home, uh, virtual reality, digital health, wearable solar devices, and similar products along with their parts and components. Next, please. So basically, um, this is our um, uh, new industrial policy, which already embeds uh, the various uh, priority sectors, as you can see on the slide. So we um, separated uh, these uh, various activities to be incentivized under the CREATE. Uh, these are grouped into three. One would be activities that would help us rebuild the economy. So this would include modern basic needs, such as food security, agriculture, fishing, health, water, infrastructure, education, shelter, and sanitation. The next group would consist of competitive and resilient uh, activities, such as green ecosystems, defense, security, and other um, uh, parts and uh, um, activities that would address gaps in our supply and value chain, such as uh, an integrated uh, steel uh, plant, health and health systems, um, chemicals, plastic, green metals, wafer fabrication, and so on. And the last group, this would consist of uh, accelerated uh, activities to help in the accelerated transformation of the economy, and hence the focus on the adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies and other industry 4.0 uh, technologies. And the aim, of course, is to grow globally competitive and innovative industries that would support our economic recovery, our growth, improve uh, our environmental sustainability along with the quality of life. And uh, as we implement all of these policies uh, with uh, the SIPP, with the incentives being provided under the CREATE, the Strategic Investment Priority Plan, together with horizontal and policy measures, we believe that this would catalyze industrial development and digital transformation, which could lead to a shared prosperity for all and the alleviation of poverty and inequality in the country. Okay, next please. I am about to uh, wrap, wrap up. So if you, can you move please to the next slide? We believe that uh, new technologies like AI are not here to destroy jobs or replace humans, but to create new jobs and change what work looks like, augment human intelligence and skills, and make our workplaces safer. We keep the people at the center of all our fourth industrial revolution transformation plans with focus on inclusive growth and enabling people at every level of society to take part in building an innovative and creative uh, future. So in this, with Industry 4.0, industries can be made more efficient and scalable, leapfrog to inclusive, resilient, and sustainable industrial development. And we are hoping that we can continue to work together as we embark on our digital transformation journey, ensuring shared prosperity for all and that no one is left behind. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Yusek Fita, for giving us a fresh background on DTI's plans as we face in the smart manufacturing, digitalization. This is a, a talk of town, Industry 4.0, and in also uplifting Philippine skills framework to prepare our workforce for the jobs in the future. And happy to know that logistics and supply chain is one of the first industries to accelerate in this platform. And uh, may we ask the Undersecretary to please stay on camera as we go to the next part of today's program, the induction of the 2022 officers and directors of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. To my fellow directors, please also go on camera as we call you one by one. Our president for this year is uh, Mr. Pierre Carlo Puray of XVC Logistics. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yusek Pita. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Our president-elect for this year is Mr. Dennis Leovido of Nestle, Philippines. Morning, morning, Yusek. Good morning. 
Our secretary for this year is Miss Christine Pardinius of Robinson Supermarket Corporation. Morning, everyone. Morning. Our treasurer for this year is yours truly, Rose Tobeo of Unilab. Good morning. Good morning, once again. Our auditor for this year is Mark Anthony Laguna, Doctor and Gamble Philippines. Now I would like to introduce our director, starting with Mr. Amante Aguilar of Del Monte, Philippines. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Mr. Cesar Lusanta Jr. of Zubalig Pharma Corporation. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Mr. John Wayne Maravilla of Johnson & Johnson, Philippines. Hi, good morning. Okay. Mr. Jose Marvin Casipe of San Miguel Yamamura Packaging Corporation. Morning, everyone. And finally, Mr. Ricardo Amante of Coca-Cola Beverages, Philippines. And now our inducting officer, Undersecretary Rafaelita Aldaba of the Department of Trade and Industry will swear our or will swear, swear in our officers and directors. Okay. Can we start now? So yes. do we raise do we raise our hand? <laughs> okay. I please uh, state your name. I I I do hereby swear to abide by and follow the constitution and bylaws of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. Do hereby swear to abide by and follow the constitution and bylaws of the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. That I will faithfully and conscientiously discharge my duties and responsibilities as the state your position of this association. That, that, that I will be faithfully and conscientiously discharge my, my duties and responsibilities of this association. That I will conduct myself in the performance of such duties with all good fidelity. That I, will I will conduct myself, myself in the performance of such duties with all good fidelity. And that I will impose upon myself this voluntary obligation without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. And that I will impose, I will impose upon myself, upon myself voluntary this voluntary obligation without any any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. So help me God. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Congrats, everyone. Congrats, congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats. Congratulations. Congratulations to the SC Maps Board of Directors for 2022. And thank you uh, once again, Ms. Fita, for honoring us with uh, your presence. Maybe also request that you keep your cameras on shortly for the photo op. Smile. Nico, please tell us if uh, it's complete. Hold on a minute. Okay, we're good. Let's skip the second panels. Okay. Very good, Nerdos. May we now request the board of directors to raise their oath taking forms. Yeah, but yeah, for you could have put you gotta have the e-prints and skip that. Carlo is looking for it. 
Sige, sige. Kahit yung iba na lang, hindi naman kailangan lahat. Okay, one, two. Okay, one more, one more. Okay, we're good. Good. Okay. Thank you, Yusek. Thank you, uh, BOD. Thank you, Yusek. Thank you, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you're watching Supply Chain Outlook Live. We will continue now with our second speaker, also a titan in promoting innovation in the Philippines and around the world. Dr. Paco Sandez is chairman of the Philippine Development Foundation, a nonprofit organization committed to advancing science and technology for national development. He is also co-founder of the EdTech firm SEPTO Education, which aims to bring digital transformation to education in the Philippines and the brain drain or brain gain network, which connects professionals from the Philippine global diaspora. He also supports various high technology firms through his role as managing founder of Nara Ventures. He is the first summa cum laude graduate of the applied physics program of the University of the Philippines. Wow. He later took his uh, MS and PhD from Stanford University, where he co-invented the grating light valve, okay, whatever that is, a fundamental technology in optical communication and display systems, and one of Stanford's top IP moneymakers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Paco Sandez. Thank you for that kind um introduction and also it's thank awesome, you to Yusek Fita. Can you hear me? Am I heard? Yes, we are. Clear, sir. Okay. Um, and I'll share some slides later, but uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for this uh, honor of uh, speaking before your association. Um, in fact, I, I feel sometimes a little, how do you say, not, not capacitated to give this speech because my uh, sister, is actually a global supply chain expert at McKinsey. So Anna Walbert, um, she used to work for Unilever and uh, moved to McKinsey after her MBA at MIT. And so just, luckily I could tap her brain and get some um, knowledge from her McKinsey reports, kind of like uh, USAC FITA. But I will also share some of my, my direct experience in digital transformation and digital innovations from my own companies and my own work and then in addition, from our perspective as um, Philippine Development Foundation. So um, first I'd like to start by giving a little motivation. Um, as we innovate in areas like I was introduced as the founder of Zepto Education, in Zepto Education, we were asked by the DepEd in 2012 to fix the computer access devices in the schools. Um, which fast forward to today, now we realize why they needed to do that because um, it is so hard to do remote learning from the home and from the school if you don't have devices. Well, at that point, we were digitizing the schools and putting computer laboratories in them and they didn't work. So fast forward anyway, we were building and we built the first Philippine designed and manufactured computer in Laguna, designed in Muntinlupa in our offices. However, we noticed how uncompetitive we could become if our supply chain wasn't working. And uh, oftentimes it would uh, be challenged. We would have to pay 40% more for components or sometimes double even. The parts would come uh, months later when my experience in the United States, I could get parts in one day. And similarly in China, we could get parts in a, a few days. And so we could see that we were um, disadvantaged in that regard. So. Clearly, from the work of the Philippine Development Foundation and the companies that we work with, it is truly challenging. And we commend the Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines, the DTI, for having this, this seminar or this conference because it is truly a way to make the Philippines more competitive and make us um, prosper. And now I can talk about FieldDev. Let me share about FieldDev. Go to my slideshow. So at FieldDev, like Yusek Fita described also, we would like to, 
to eradicate, eradicate poverty um, through the use of science and technology-based education. And with educated Filipinos, we want them to turn into inventors, R&D professionals, and that's what we call innovation. Finally, the innovations are, are great, but they're not useful until they're converted into tools to help society. And to do that, we really need entrepreneurship. And that's why these three pillars of education, innovation, and entre entrepreneurship are foundations of uh, are the pillars of FieldDev. I want to go a little bit into the history of FieldDev just for your um, information and so that you can understand us. Um, actually, even before the 2013 programs, in about uh, 2006, FieldDev Chairman Daro Banatao at that time was it. He's a chair still of the United States. I chair the Philippine side. We have two entities, one in the US, one here. Um, we had uh, helped lobby then President GMA and Congress to unlock a huge amount of about 5 billion pesos for more scholarships for the DOST. It's uh, ERDT. And at that time, it also helped create laboratories and buildings and research facilities for our students, masters and PhDs, and also undergrads. So we're very proud of, of, of that focus, even if it's not directly uh, money through FieldDev, it was helping the government to focus its efforts on scholarships for STEM students. And there, from there, we, we started to focus also on the innovation portion. So in addition to the ERDT scholarships, FieldDev ended up getting private funding also to add to the ERDT scholarships. And this ERDT, this FieldDev Philippine scholarships have graduated uh, about 250 graduates in STEM as well. We have implemented our own entrepreneurship acceleration program with USAID. And you see a picture here of um, lecturers, both from the Philippines and from the United States to help our startups in the Philippines to accelerate their startups. And then we focus on the innovation part. If you have STEM um, trained professionals who have masters and PhDs and undergrads in, in engineering, computer science, artificial intelligence, we have to also train them to become more innovative and do research. And so that's why we partnered with the Commission on Higher Education to set up uh, tech hubs in the universities and partnering also with the professors so that they can train the, the other researchers in these areas. So it's a lot of really capacity building. And in 2017, we started with UNDP and Australian Embassy, um, the ESIP program, which is fo to focus on enterprises that are not just for pure profit, but also for social impact. And finally, we started to see that it would be, well, we saw this already, but we, we implemented the program in 2020 and 2021, where we formed Field Dev Labs, which is to launch um, innovation challenges in partnership with some companies, for example, Messi Bessi or the Cebuana Lulier Foundation, to focus on innovations that they know as foundations could directly impact the financial inclusion or other aspects of Philippine uh, society. And finally, this is one area that I'd like to talk to you at the end of this uh, presentation, the Jumpstart program, where we will talk about a collaboration between the startups um, and even SME and maybe even larger companies that might be in the Supply Chain Association of the Philippines, because a lot of the innovative ideas tend to happen in startups. However, these startups need to be solving worthwhile problems and worthwhile problems happen in your companies or in the government or in uh, other as areas of industry. By the way, the picture here is uh, um, some Berkeley professors and Berkeley students working with our startups as well. So these are just some, some, some information about our programs, uh, the 253 scholars, the faculty members that were trained in Technopreneurship 101 with the CHED program. In addition, when you have these startups in our challenges, in our incubation uh, programs, the, you have uh, 
a number of innovations that will happen. Sometimes um, the innovations happen within the incubation program. It doesn't just, they, they don't necessarily come to us with inventions like, um, like the bamboo program, et cetera. They, they may happen within our incubation uh, program as well. And then a number of them, 11, have received grants from their challenge partners and sponsors. So we're very proud of uh, the outcome so far. And uh, we empower through entrepreneurship, the 59 startups, um, 29 in the social impact accelerator and 30 in the impact boost camp. And these are some of the startups we have uh, supported. FHM Moms, um, People Pods, Fame, Hirai Water, Bamboo High. You may have heard of them already. So we're just very proud to enable these entrepreneurs. And this is where we're very happy to be also working with USEC FITA in the DTI. Um, this is in collaboration with them. Fieldev is incubating in two, two programs, the IDEA program and the advanced program. This is our partnership with DTI to accelerate growing startups that aim to assist um, through scaling up their business operations, enable them to, to focus and uh, fine tune their products, um, give them all the tools that they need to be stronger in financial planning, uh, marketing, all the good stuff that startups have to have. And uh, this is something we've been doing over the, the period and you saw the, the results. Now we're happy to be doing it in partnership with the DTI. Um, advance is for the more advanced companies and IDEA is for the earlier stage companies. So thank you, Yusek Fita and DTI. And uh, there are three companies that I, just to give an example of where we think uh, um, FieldDev has been able to participate, at least in your ecosystem of supply chain management. We have three startups that I asked my team to come up with. Is it, are there any companies in the supply chain area? And uh, these, these are the ones they, they shared with us. Um, so Agri, Agro Digital PH is a digital platform for business to business transactions. Um, focusing on the farmers. Uh, Miami is also agri-tech startup um, to connect organic farmers with their own buyers. And Inside SCS aims to con connect the supply chain uh, through technology. So these are early stage companies inside our portfolio of uh, incubated companies. But I'd like to also share with you that through my own personal experience, um, I could share some of the things I see, and you have probably seen it, and they're probably advertising to you as uh, supply chain practitioners. So some of the larger companies. So you may have heard of Xlog. Um, this is a participant in the supply, supply chain. I think they were in the business of freight forwarding, um, trucking, shipping. Um, so the Inyon family, um, came to me and asked me for, for help and advice as they were digitizing their, their own disruption in a way. They knew that their, the whole supply chain management, uh, the supply chain would be disrupted. And they decided that uh, they wanted to do that before they their own business was cannibalized. So we helped them with a sister company, well, with a company that I'm involved with, Stratpoint. And we helped them build their proof of concept and then help them raise their money from a union bank. And this is their picture of them um, with their union bank agreement. So I think in their case, they're trying to help uh, the booking of trucks, the ships and the freight forwarders, et cetera. And of course, many of you probably heard the LBC um, Scion, uh, Dino and Ar Araneta, innovating with Quadex. Um, and that's for everyone. Everyone probably has heard of them already. They've done shipping cart and uh, Go Go Express as some of their innovative uh, um, products and services. And of course, uh, to go LBC, DHL, GRS, Express, we know that the big players are not gonna allow the, these startups to just eat their lunch without a fight. So we know that to go Express um, and the others are, are making their own digital efforts uh, be heard and seen. So to me, I'd like to share a little bit about my 
my takeaway or what I see from from the industry, if if I could uh, just opine. So the glo global innovations and challenges as these are things that I, I, I gathered from uh, McKinsey report as well. So the new problems emerge like senior, especially the pandemic moved people to adopt very quickly as uh, Yusek Fita already described. But now as the pandemic is, is starting to get under control, the attention that the senior leaders of uh, companies, they, they may be turning away from the supply chain issues. This is what McKinsey is observing from their surveys. In many sectors, they say there are signs that the rate of investment in digital supply chain technologies is slowing down. Clearly, at the beginning, everybody said, OK, we got to go digital. We got to invest. But uh, now that it's it's starting to regularize, people are taking their, their eye off uh, the, the target. And then number two here, I think, and I see it very clearly in a company that I'm involved with, and I'll tell you a little bit later, is that the talent for digital is, is big, right? The talent gap, sorry. So the people are lacking. You may say, I want to invest in artificial intelligence. I want to invest in data lakes and gather all the information. But when you turn to your managers and say, do this for me, um, they look at you and say, well, you got to give me money or you've got to give me the resources. You, let, you have to let me hire. So the, these are not easy problems to solve. And other issues like end-to-end -end transparency remains elusive. Um, and then th this focus on localized flexible supply chain management. These are er things that um, the McKinsey report has shared with us. I wanted to give two examples, for example, here, right? The, if you think that you invested in Excel or you in invested in some Tableau or some data lake, and yet you cannot see into your second tier um, supply chain, then you really still haven't solved the whole problem. So um, a big problem that everyone has heard about is that the chip fabrication, this tier three, is a reason why you cannot buy cars today, right? There's, there's a, a lack of supply of cars because of the tier three um, supply chain layer, right? Because of the chips. So Tesla, luckily, they made their own chips and they were able to ship cars, but the others, they couldn't. And the problem is in the McKinsey report, only 2% of uh, global companies are actually able to see into that level of their supply chain. So something very deep and analytical that struck me as I read the reports preparing for this presentation. And this is the one that hits home for me because I am in the business of supplying digital talent to companies as a, a digital enterprise advisor, consultant, and uh, software developer. We have so much interest in advanced analytics and it comes as little surprise that, cri that the crisis has been a catalyst for further digitization of end-to-end -end supply chain processes. So you need analytics, as uh, Yusek Fita said, we wanna focus on AI and data analytics, but if you don't have the talent, how will you do it? And the exhibit below shows how companies are saying that we don't have the talent, right? And there's some talent sufficient now. It's it's really a challenge. That's what this this chart is saying. So, my experience is there are some practical approaches to digital transformation. As I have the the blessing of sitting on a few boards of some rather large companies in the Philippines, as we embarked on digital transformation in some in two of these digital banks that I've been involved with. Um, in the past and in the present and in uh, the number one insurance company and in my own role as the chairman of uh, Stratpoint Technologies, which is a digital advisor and also by the other role as a digital transformation um, practitioner in Zepto Education. One of the big pieces of advice I I'd like to give everybody is do not fall in love with technology for technology's sake because many times you have technology as a solution looking for a problem. Luckily, you in this industry, well, not luckily, but um, in this industry, we do have problems. So we have to focus on those real problems and plan carefully. Don't fall in love with just buying technology and then investing in, in the wrong things. So my third bullet is focus on the right technologies. You need to have the right trusted people because oftentimes, 
the the vendors, the technology providers, they'll sell you so many things, but sometimes maybe you don't really need it all, right? I'm, am I making sense? Am I still heard? Yes, you're still there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's yes, kind of hard uh, with this. It's hard with this setup. <laughs> Somehow I'm, I'm looking at the slides and uh, anyway, so thank you everybody. Um, so at Stratpoint is one of my companies that I'm involved with and I'm sorry, I don't intend to be an advertise, this to be an advertisement for my company. But I just wanted to share with you our experience as digital transformation practitioners. We help companies digitize, like we said, with Xlog and with Union Bank, Sun Life, and the others, right? Globe is a, a big company as well. I'll give you another example. So in this company, what happens here is at the beginning, we just became software developers. You know, when somebody wants an, a mobile application, a website, or um, look at cybersecurity or the quality assurance, that's the first column. We do that all the time. Everyone does that. Um, we do not do body shopping, by the way, but we try and lend the, the brains of the Stratpoint people for, for your software development. But clearly in the pandemic, this other three areas of our business accelerated tremendously. People ask for cloud migration because before you'd go to the office, you'd, you'd get your email there, you'd have your files there, but everybody had to move their data and their, their applications to the cloud. So we are big partners of AWS and uh, this is a very important part. And the applications also became uh, what your IT people will probably tell you, it had to become cloud native. It, it wouldn't be the traditional application. And then, of course, uh, this is what we're talking about now in supply chain. It's a data, right? Data, data, data. So a number of the stars I may have talked about, that's how they, they pitch their, their service to everybody that we know everything that's going on in your supply chain. Um, so that's the other important aspect of the service. And then finally, in the lab, Stratpoint Labs, what we help people do is then apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, facial recognition, chatbots, everything like that, and in internet of things to the services. Why do I bring this up? Be because as an example, um, SM allows us to talk about it a little bit. So we are providing them services and it's not just to do product design, planning their, their IT architecture for this specific service of their malls, but I think, it really helps give business value and it hopefully gives perspective to the audience that number one, it allows for seamless digital commerce. It improves the manual operations that were alluded to by uh, Yusek Fita during her keynote. And it allows for the resolution of this store order inconsistencies, um, ordering um, pieces or SKUs that are not available and the customers want it. And so we have all these things and it's, it's important for, for our companies to, to apply digital tools so that you will have this information at hand to become more efficient and more competitive. So the last part I'd like to end this and maybe focus then on question and answer is at FieldDev, what we're trying to do is work with DTI and work with companies like yourselves, because like I said, you have problems um, everybody has problems, of course, in the digital transformation journey um, or little aspects that you may want to improve on. And it is very hard to have the talent in-house. You could hire companies like Stratpoint, for example, but at FieldDev, what we're also trying to do is help you to maybe find these startups, these very talented um, entrepreneurs that may have some very innovative ideas already or products and services that might help you. And the role that we think that the field of uh, group could serve is to be the catalyst to connect you um, to each other. So if, if you may uh, find it uh, something beneficial to you, please contact us. So what we're looking at here is like 80% of the SMEs, um, now they see the value of digital, but they're still struggling on how to do that, right? They're still struggling how to do it. 
and why should companies work with startups? Startups have the potential to stimulate these innovations that may happen in your companies right now. For example, they could build an agile environment for the development of internal innovations. Um, so you could move faster, work faster, um, rather than you have to worry about, okay, who do I hire? Which vendor do I work with? Who do I trust? Of course, you'll have to also learn to trust these startups, but uh, you, there's a dating process in a way. There's a dating process in field dev, so you can get to know them uh, through this jumpstart program, and you don't need to commit to anybody. You may not want to, but at least you have the choice. You have, you have the view of them. And then through them, if you participate in this jumpstart program of field, field dev, you'll gain consumer insights and quickly respond to emerging markets um, given the adoption of technology innovations. You kind of have an, an eye on more things through the eyes of the startups. And then you'll be able to generate uh, some, some quick solutions with these startups for the, the gaps that you may have in your companies. And finally, there, there's also a group of investors who, who, go, who are in that network also. So, you know, you, it, you've been part of that network and there might be investment opportunities for them and you together, or even you, your companies directly. So, you know, this Jumpstart program is something that is enabled by also the partnership with DTI and also the other partners that FieldDev has. So there's many things that uh, I guess the field dev network is enabling. Um, you have companies that are big like Stratpoint and, and uh, the others, but uh, there's also the ability to work with the startups. Um, and I think I, I'll end here because I really prefer to interact with you and make sure that I'm talking to the right points and, and maybe answering your questions. Thank you for the honor to speak to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paco. Um, it's really heartwarming to know that there are groups like, uh, you know, PhilDev that champions innovation, new inventions, R&D that uh, supports startup entrepreneurs. As we all know, this is the heart of progress. And yes, champion, digitalization is the way to go in almost all industries, not just supply chain. There is indeed a need for uh, that single line of sight you know, um, at the end to end uh, uh, supply chain that you have visibility in the, in the upstreams of your second tier suppliers and in the downstreams of your uh, second tier or third tier customers and even the end consumer. And um, that could really help us in our digital transformation. So looking forward to that, uh, Dr. Bach. And uh, I think there's a, a comment uh, here in the chat box uh, from Dr. Uh, from uh, Yusek Fita. She said, transformational change is 90% human and only 10% digital. Transformational change is about faith in people. Uh, we must put people at the center of our digital transformation as technologies are indeed only as powerful as the people who build it, use and improve on these technologies. People have Activity, vision, and ethical judgment that technology only augments. That's also a good insight there. So, uh, guys, if there are any questions out there, uh, so that uh, our, our panelists could uh, respond. While waiting for the questions to come up, I, I'll just second what uh, Yusek Fita is talking about here in the people. In fact, one of our biggest customers is asking Stratpoint and Zepto not only to just help them do the digital transformation and make their data useful, they're also asking us to train their staff because like um, during my time as independent board director at Union Bank, one of the reasons why Union Bank is so successful is that they've actually embarked on a, a serious uh, training program for, for all their cadets so that they learn about dig digital technologies. Um, so people who were maybe a relationship managers, they were converted to becoming also digital uh, data analysts, for example, and data scientists. So the same thing is happening in, in the companies that are getting serious about uh, artificial intelligence and data science. And by the way, again, thanks to DTI and Yusek Fita through these programs that uh, she has, I'm partnered with Fieldev for 
we are training not just entrepreneurs, but everybody who participates will get more um, advanced in their expertise. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a uh, question uh, that's coming from the chat box. Starting the digital transformation can be intimidating, especially if it's not your core expertise. So what's the best first step to take? Thank you for that question. Um, it's, it's actually a, a slide that I put up. Uh, let's see. Um, let me see if I can get the slide up again. But it was that piece of advice, the practical piece of advice here. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I speak too fast. I was just mindful of the time and I hope I, hope I, I, got, I was clear. It's okay, it's just right. Yeah. yeah, so again, first, People will keep telling you, you have to be in digital, you know, digital, digital, buy Google, buy this, buy Microsoft, buy this, buy Tableau, um, hire all these nerds. But I guess first your board or your ownership, you, you've got to figure out what, what am I really trying to do? What are my true problems here? Right. Don't don't start investing in everything and you'll end up with um, unused technology. I'll give you an example. So people say in education, buy, buy a learning management system or even in your company. So buy a learning management system for your staff. So they'll all become digital experts. So buy it. But then your HR or L&D professional, learning and development professionals, they're actually not equipped on how to use those tools. Then it will sit there and, and just gather dust for a while until they catch up. So the first things you may have to do is study and learn about the technologies, talk to experts, um, read the right papers, and understand, okay, what, what are the first areas of improvement in my company? Typically, it's the basic parts of digitization, like, okay, where, where are my um, very manual processes that at least I want to capture, invoicing, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not directly in your industry at the moment, but I, I'd be happy to send some of the Stratpoint people to be the ones to talk to you. If you trust them, if you trust me, but if not us, there, I'm sure there are other experts and consultants you can talk to, right? So learn to figure out who you can trust as well to guide you through these processes. That's my first big piece of advice really look look for someone who can guide you and 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 uh yeah mentor you through the process i hope that makes sense yes yes thank you very much uh, again centering to the to the people behind it because uh, uh any kind of digital digital transformation will will, will not be possible will not be successful without the people uh you know right trusted people uh who are really behind it, who knows the process uh, before really going into uh, investment. And um, uh, yeah, there are some notes here also in, in, in the chat box that uh, the innovations, it's trailblazing and it serves as a prelude in how the future will look alike. But uh, as highlighted by USEC uh, FITA, it's uh, equally transforming the business process. Uh, also denote connections on information and insights that has to be considered in redesigning business processes. The old ways should need to be redesigned too. Otherwise, it is like digitizing, digitalizing, digitalizing old processes. You don't maximize the opportunity that way. If companies can find the right balance to this, that's where success will come from. It's coming from one of the board of directors of SEMA, Mr. Amante Aguilar. Thank you so much for that uh, insight, uh, sir. And also from Frances Barsana, tap into innovation sources, exposure, cooperation, and trial, and the proof of concepts. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's true. The startup community is free on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. The the one thing I noticed also, and I'll add this, is that typically the, the organizations that have had successful digital transformations, there's always a champion on their board, right? There's somebody there. Typically, that board member also has to represent the strong will of the owners or the majority shareholders so that 
budgets will be realigned and invested in this digital transformation process. If you don't have that champion, you might have a lone wolf um, shouting and, and crying for years. And that person may be right, but um, it's just going to be futile, right? So I guess the, the champion has to convince everybody that this is needed, that this is the way forward because it's going to happen. And so part of my purpose today is to, to, to share with everybody that it is happening. And if you don't disrupt your own processes, you, you will be in trouble. Your competitors will outmaneuver you. Um, and then second, once, at least my experience, and it's not to um, how do you carry your own banco, as they say in Filipino, but um, that one time, a few times where the board members recognized that they need to do this, then that's when they invited me to be an independent director. So I would become the digital transformation voice in that board. And then I could help them to figure out, okay, what are the steps we have to take and how do we avoid making the wrong investments and continue to do all the right things that they're doing. And of course, there will be mistakes along the way. That's okay. You always, there's mistakes are acceptable. It's just how we, we make changes and take a, a pivot as they say in the startup world. And that's, that's a good way also, because it has to start at the top. If, if that doesn't happen, there's no money for hiring those people. There's no money for investing in the tools and resources. That's right. And I think there are some who will want to contact you <laughs> to talk to you further about digital transformation, which they are uh, looking into in their companies or in their organization. Uh, there are a lot of companies who are already starting their digital transformation uh, programs, uh, uh, like uh, Nestle, uh, Dennis said, uh, worldwide, they have a digital acceleration team and each market have their own champion as well. So, uh, yes, um, Carla, do you have um, any inputs uh, you want to, to say before we let go, <laughs> Dr. Paco? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm still digesting. Uh, I'm, I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I'm all about innovation. Um, thank you for, for asking me. Uh, in fact, this is very close to my heart. Uh, I'm part of the FieldDev program. Uh, I'm the CEO of Insight SES um, that joined the advanced program just last week. Uh, and and um, we thank you. We thank uh, Yusek Fita and, and uh, Dr. Paco uh, on, this, you know, on this program. So we're looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so I... I have I have a, a bunch of things actually in my mind. You know, innovation is really um, the, the 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 next, and then what what what's really needed for our for our um, uh, our industry, right? So and there's a lot of things to digest. Um, I think I have uh, on on my closing statements later. <laughs> I have a lot of uh, um, manifestation also on 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 the information that we read earlier. So yeah, it's basically it. <laughs> I can uh, if I can start already. Maybe maybe there's still other questions before I. Yes, I... Carla. Before I turn over to you, I'll. Uh, uh, there's there's a question from Adrian Martin C, who says that I am new to the industry of supply chain. What are the factors to look or consider in order for us to adapt in digitalization? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's looking for what are the key parameters that they're ready already for. They're ready to adapt uh, digital transformation. That's that's a good point. I'm I'm honestly not directly involved in like the SM projects and the other Stratpoint projects, um, but typically the way we start is to look at our processes and look at them all and look at where are the big bottlenecks. What are the things that are leading to, I guess you could say, risk to our supply chain, right? Are there big delays because of this? So you're trying to see where the biggest impacts are. And by analyzing, then you can figure, okay, I think that's where we should focus, right? And of course, there are the kind of like obvious things if your companies are not already doing it. It's like, of course, your recording of your inventory, recording of your SKUs, in recording of your 
your invoicing, receipting, all of that. If that's not digital, clearly it has to be. And then you have to figure out, okay, what is the general enterprise architecture? That's a word that I'd like to, to encourage everybody to have because you really have to plan, plan, plan. And so when you plan for your digital investments in the future, um, I'm sorry, I'm, maybe Adrian, I'm getting ahead of myself going forward, right? But later on, you might buy one piece for like a database system, one for the app development system. And then later you have to keep adding. And if you bought products that don't coexist well with each other, you're going to have to start to throw away things and then start again, which is very painful in your your enterprise, right? One, um, wasted time. Number two, sometimes wasted money also and resources. Um, luckily, as I think somebody here might be very familiar already with the startup world, there is a software as a service. So you don't need to buy all the software now. You could just subscribe to it. That's the beauty here. So you can change your mind later on. But still, when you change your mind, ideally, you don't change through too drastically because You'll have to retool your people. You have to re retrain them. That's very painful for your staff and, and people. It's hard enough to train them to do one digital transformation. To do it two, three times, you might lose them in the process, right? They'll just get too frustrated. So um, I don't know. I'm talking about a lot of things. Uh, I apologize, but it, it really is a, a wide scope. And until we see your specific uh, problems in your, your specific company, it's hard to give a very general um, recommendation at this point. Thank you again for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much there, uh, Dr. Paco Sandejas of uh, Philbeck. Very insightful discussion there. And now our final speaker for today is the president of Supply Chain Management Association of the Philippines. He is also vice president for business solutions of XVC Logistics and the co-founder and CEO of Insight SES, a supply chain technology firm. Through these roles, he has worked to ensure more efficient and effective supply chains for all stakeholders. He helped develop the scan dashboard and the incident reporter app, which the IATF uses to monitor logistics bottlenecks in the country. He also helped develop Deliver E, a logistics platform spearheaded by the DTI and DA aiming to better connect farmers with a wider food market. He has also helped expand supply chain education to entrepreneurs across the country through the Go Negosho Kapatid Mentor Me program. Ladies and gentlemen, to present SEMAP's plans and initiatives for 2022 and beyond, Mr. Pierre Carlo Curay. Uh, um, what a morning. <laughs> This is a, such a great start. Um, we're honored our, to have Yusek Fita and Dr. Sandejas to be with us and provide us insight in the world of innovation. And we're very thankful, I myself am very thankful for sharing uh, your time and expertise. And, and we know that you have provided tremendous value to everybody. I'm sure there's still a lot more questions and people will, will still um, get in touch, right? Uh, special thanks also to our dear friend, Dr. Henry Basilio of UPAF, uh, Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development, who made this possible, who helped us here, and has been with us in supporting our initiatives for around 30 years now. Truly a great partner to push forward the Philippine supply chain to be globally competitive. On a personal note, like I mentioned earlier, this is very close to my heart. Uh, I'm also into technology, and I'm grateful with DTI and PhilDev, especially Dr. Fita and Dr. Paco, for having this program. Uh, like they said, I'm the, the CEO of the startup Insight SES, and we were just included in the advanced program just last week. Um, Insight SES helps supply chain digitalization for multinational companies, and we're grateful for this initiative and really looking forward to that. So um, SEMAP has been the leader when it comes to advocacy. We're always called upon to serve our industry, and for 30 years, we're always, we always answer the call. We work closely with government on drafting policies and position papers on issues that affect supply chain, both locally and globally. We collaborate with both private and government partners to find solutions to major problems. Like for example, during the pandemic, we were tasked to provide insight and suggestions to the IATF to ensure the flow of movement of goods in unhampered. Perennial problems like port congestions, global shipping trade, and disaster response, you know. Um, supply chain and logistics is very, um, uh, it, it's really complex here in the Philippines, you know, because of 
uh, our archipelagic nature, right? We have different islands, constantly visited by by disasters and all of that. But the Filipino practitioner, the supply chain practitioners are very resilient, right? We've, we've overcome more and more problems each and every day. At SMAP, we also communicate with our colleagues and members in the industry to provide information and updates to share, especially those that would affect them, like government policies, industry updates, best practices that are shared. We also gather inputs or suggestions from our members on their pain points yeah, to share to, um, to, share to the industry at large to collaborate and find solutions. This was most prevalent during the height of the pandemic where there's so much uncertainties. We strengthen our communications to constantly update and provide guidance to the industry at large. We saw how, as an industry, we banded together to keep supply chain moving and at the same time kept the movement of goods unhampered, which is essential for all of us to bounce back. Together, we can overcome any challenge, right? SEMAP also focuses on upgrading skills and knowledge to become globally competitive. This year, um, we started last year, but this year, one of our main focus, our partnership with De La Salle University School of Lifelong Learning for the certificate course in the enterprise supply chain management. We're proud to say that we're getting rave reviews in the first run we had last year. And this is because of the strength and deep experience of our practitioners who, are, who share their time and experience and, 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 and knowledge and skills. The likes of Nes uh, Felicio, Teng Aguilar, right? Dennis Lovido, and Rose Tubeo, that has extensive operational experience added with their deep knowledge in supply chain. We're able to provide extensive value to the learners, right? I invite everybody to join this program. I think we're going to have two programs, two runs for this year. Um, aside from that, we have strong partnership with Testa and DTI in the development of the, like what uh, Yusik Fita mentioned earlier, uh, of the supply chain skills development framework, you know, the standardized and benchmark for warehouse personnel, truck drivers, coordinators, supervisors, even managerial executive. Um, we, I think we benchmark also with, with Singapore uh, on this uh, skills framework. These two programs shows uh, our focus on continuous learning to all stakeholders in any supply chain, regardless on which level. We also have multiple seminars and activities throughout this year, like this one, right? So, so um, we're looking forward to more learnings. Um, we, we adapt it uh, on, on the current environment and we see how we can provide more value to each of our um, uh, stakeholders, not only our members, but also the whole supply chain industry. We have heard from our wonderful, wonderful speakers and I myself learned a lot. Understanding the innovation ecosystem and how both government and private partners brings this forward. You see, supply chain and logistics has been a laggard in the innovation space. It is because of how complex and difficult supply chain is. However, in the past years, especially during the pandemic, the importance of supply chain become front and center. There's a saying that it was a thankless job. When everything is running smoothly, we don't get noticed as much. However, when something goes wrong, then become, we <laughs> become front and center, right? I'm sure our colleagues here can relate. However, now there is a major focus in supply chain, trade, the movement of goods. As what the pandemic highlighted, without supply chain and logistics, everything becomes a standstill. And with that renewed focus, innovation has been happening as what, as what Dr. Paco and, and Yusek Fitin mentioned earlier, right? So one of the major thrusts of, of SEMAP this year is highlighting those innovations. There are many best practices we can learn from each other and bring to our industry. In general, supply chain is quite disconnected and fragmented like what Dr. Paco showed earlier um, with the different, uh, I'm sorry, Yusek Fita showed earlier, um, uh, mostly are still using paper to fly around manifest and import documents. Um, uh, each, part are, uh, each part of the supply chain are in silos. Uh, they're not working together. Um, the invoice is still in paper, not yet digitized. Um, so uh, where just imagine now we can instantly order grocery or food from your app, right? Delivered straight to you. But in our industry, supply chain is still, is still uh, fragmented and still paper-based and still manual, right? So it really begs the question, uh, why not, right? So um, until now, we're still reliant with SMS, messaging apps, and even mobile calls to coordinate deliveries, right? There's no visibility. Uh, I, I totally agree 2% only of, of you know, um, supply chains are visible. Case in point, right? I want to ask everybody, um, if you can raise your hands, raise your hands. Who here has a ton of Viber or Messenger groups to coordinate logistics activities? Everyone I talk to, um, right? Everyone I talk to has 
uh, a bunch of uh, groups, right? Messaging, uh, just to coordinate deliveries, um, paperwork, etc. However, a lot of our members here always has innovations in their supply chains. I think they're the part of the 2%, like the likes of Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Unilab, Del Monte, San Miguel, who uses technology to optimize their supply chains. I read that digitalization and visibility alone of the supply chain can lead to 30% in productivity. Unfortunately, uh, like what Dr. Papa mentioned earlier, only 2% of visibility is in their supply chain, right? And but what we, what you said, uh, Fita mentioned earlier that the pandemic with the pandemic digitalization has been advanced by seven or more years. So we're now living in the future, guys, right? So although the uptake of the innovation has been quite slow to the industry, but we will change that and have SMAP to lead the way. This year we will continue to advocate for a stronger Philippine supply chain, engage our colleagues and members to collaborate more, and provide updates information that will help them succeed. Provide them learning activities for continuous learning and enable them to grow and succeed. In behalf of the board and directors, we are here to answer the call, same as the ones who, want, who went before us. And I invite you later this afternoon also for the next sessions where the sought after uh, Ronilo Balbiran, he will share the economic outlook for this year. I guarantee you, you will learn a lot. Thank you again to Yusek Fita and Dr. Paco for sharing us valuable lessons. And to everybody who joined us today you know, to, to take time um, to, to, to listen and to understand and know about SEMAP. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a great week ahead. Thank you very much, Carlo, president of uh, SEMAP. And that wraps up the first half of today's Supply Chain Outlook Live. Thank you to our speakers, Yusek Rafaelita Aldaba of BTI and Dr. Paco Sandejas of the Philadelphia Foundation. And thank you as well for choosing to spend your morning with us. Please join us again for the second half of Supply Chain Outlook Live, which will happen at 2 p.m. later via Zoom. Oh, Reed Foundation's Ronnie Balbiran will be joining us to provide his perspective on our economic prospects for 2022. You can use the same Zoom link that you use for the session of the program. Once again, I am Rose Tubeo, and uh, we hope to see you around in our future events.